Pastor Gilbert, would you come on, Pastor Gilbert? Amen. Amen. How many love Pastor Gary Duran? Isn't he doing an awesome job with this conference? Amen. We've had some powerful words shared today that I'm going to go home. I brought my notepad. I started taking notes. I had to take notes because I want to become a better man. I want to be a better man. And I know today you see before you a guy with a sports coat, white shirt, and iron pants. Uh, I wasn't always this way. I wasn't always this way. I used to have my iron pants. <laughs> nice creases on my 501s. Baby cuffs. Nike Cortez. Had my, my, my shirts, right? That's, that's before Christ. Amen. But but here we are today, and it's just such an honor to be with you all. And uh, I believe that God wants to speak to us men. And so I, I think that there is there are many giants that we have to slay as men. And when we begin to slay these giants, God allows us to become better men, better husbands, better fathers, better Christians, better leaders. And that is the will of God. God wants us to be better because the world is looking for hope. The world is looking for people that offer more than what the world offers. And when we're stuck and bound struggling with things such as addictions, then we don't seem attractive to the world. The world doesn't want us to have great lights and great stages and great buildings. The, the world is looking for a people that have hope, that have gotten better, that are progressing, that, are, uh, that, that have something to offer. And we might not have the biggest buildings, we might not have the greatest, the greatest anything, but we have Jesus Christ who has come into our lives and changed us and transformed us. So today I have the, the, the privilege of, of talking about killing the giants of addiction. And I mentioned the sports code. And, and again, you see me here and you might wonder, well, did this guy ever have any problems with addiction? And, and, and does he have any place to speak on this thought? And, and, and I want to begin by submitting to you that I actually do. I, 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 uh, I actually do. Uh, I want to get, brother, could you put the picture up? It was uh, 2000, uh, the year 2000, February the 5th, the year 2000, when I, my older brother, the guy that you see with the white shirt, the hair back, uh, praying for that kid in the red shirt, my older brother invited me to church. I didn't want to go, I, 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 but then I thought, well, maybe I'll meet some girls there, so I decided to go. If you're single and you're looking for a wife, you got to know where to go. And so uh, I knew church was a good place to go. So I, I decided to go, and I remember going. My brother was a, an early bird. He always liked to be everywhere early. So we got there, uh, and uh, we were super early. And as I was there, I was like, man, I need a frajo. I need a cigarette. And uh, so I, I walk out of the church. I find an alley. I go smoke a cigarette, come back inside the church, and uh, someone caught me smoking a cigarette. And so... Uh, they said, so they were super nice, and so they allowed me to come sit back in. And that night, God was speaking. We had a guest speaker. Uh, it was a powerful move of the Holy Ghost, and uh, we're grateful for that. But in that night, I remember that I was arguing with God because I had been raised in the church, but I had walked away years before because I just enjoyed the world. I enjoyed uh, party, and I enjoyed different things. And so uh, as I had got, gotten away from God, uh, I was at this service, and I was wrestling within myself, saying, God, I'm not ready to serve you yet. I'm not ready to do this. I'm, I'm still young. I still got a future. I still want to have fun. I still want to party. The, and I was a tagger at the time, so my big dream was to write my name on a train. That was my, my biggest thing. Lord, when I complete that duty, then I'll come back and I'll serve you, right? But that night, the Spirit of God moved upon me, and I couldn't do anything else but but. I couldn't resist the presence anymore. So I remember raising my hands towards heaven, and I just started crying out to God, which is what you see here, that kid in the red shirt, that's me. And so I walked in there that day bound by alcohol. I was using meth. I was involved in gangs. I was riding all over the streets of Fresno. I, I was a chain smoker. But that day, God did something in my life that transformed me from that day forward. I was no longer the same. And so if, if you're asking, does this guy have anything to say about addiction and overcoming addiction, I want you to know that I do. Yeah. 
I've been there, I've done that, I got the t-shirt. But today I want to share with you some of the things that God allowed me to look back on and reflect on in order to see where I used to be and see where I am now today. And I'm not, a, I'm not perfect. If anyone says they're perfect, they're lying. All right. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we're not perfect. I'm not going to get up here and tell you that I'm perfect. God is still working on me. I'm still a work in progress. Brother, thank you so much for the word. I struggle with anger. I become a different person when I'm on the road. It's funny. The idiots do come out when I'm driving. I'm a work in progress. Amen. But I say that to say that there's hope for all of us. Amen. There's hope for all. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 40 to 51 says, Then he took a staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones for the brook, and he put them in the shepherd's bag, and a pouch which he had, and the sling which was in his hand, and he drew near the Philistine. And the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, and disdained, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, and a ruddy, good-looking uh, youth. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Verse 45 says, then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with the sword and a spear and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, who have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air, the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth that may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assemblies shall uh, know that God, the Lord, does not save with the sword or a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Verse 48. So it was that the Philistines arose and came, drew near to meet David, and David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistines, or Philistines, whatever you want to call it. Then David had put his hand in his bag, took out the stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine in the forehead, so that the stone sank in his forehead. He fell to his face on the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine uh, with, and killed him. But there were no swords in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, drew it, and out of his sheath, uh, and killed him and cut off his head. And today, I want to talk to us, though, on this thought. Killing the giants, with an S, of addiction. Killing the giants of addiction. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We bless you. God, you have been so good to us by teaching us, God, through your word, how we can conquer and kill and slay the giant of fear and of anger. But Father, there are things that we struggle with as men, addictions and vices that we have, Lord. But today you're going to give us the tools that are necessary in order for us to overcome, to overthrow, to slay, to kill these giants that lie before us, Lord. I thank you for what you're going to do. Anoint our ears to hear, open our eyes to see, touch our minds to understand, and our hearts to your word and we pray that you would anoint our bodies to put to action what we hear today we ask this in your beautiful name in the name of jesus and everyone says amen, amen. amen. clap your hands and give the lord some praise today thank you jesus in the story that we've read we read of an encounter between the enemies of israel and god's people the people of israel and so they are going back and forth at a battlefield and the Philistines, the enemy of God's people, come out with a giant, a champion, a man that's scary looking, a man that's big, a man that's crazy, someone that you don't want to mess with. And so it was a bit scary to look at this giant because he could tear your head off. No one wanted to fight this giant. He was intimidating. But now David had showed up. He saw what was going on. He heard what the giant was saying. And he knew that there was uh, something inside of him that had to bring about a change. He knew he had to do something, and if no one was going to fight the giant, he was willing to fight the giant himself. And so he fights this giant, and he fights him in an unconventional way. Instead of using a sword, instead of using a spear, instead of using a bow and arrow, instead of using different weapons that they had to offer in those times, yeah. David decided, I'm going to do this very, very differently. So the Bible tells us that he gets a sling, he gets five smooth stones, and he uses that 
in order to overthrow, to defeat, to kill the giant. And so it works. He does something that no one else was willing to do. He conquers the giant. He cuts off his head and he gives his people the victory. It was one unconventional way that he was able to slay and kill the giant. You and I at times will face addictions, will face battles, will face things in our lives, and it will require a different approach. Our approach can't always be the same. It can't be cookie cutter. And so today I want us to look at this first story of David killing this first giant as an opportunity for God to move in our lives so that we can break the back of addiction that is upon us. I believe that God wants to set each and every one of us, each, each and every one of us free, but it requires sometimes for us to do things unconventionally. Yeah. We can't do it yeah. the same way we've always yeah. done it. Yeah. If you do the same thing, expecting different results, you're going crazy. But I believe that we have to look at things from a different perspective. And so the purpose of me showing the picture earlier today was the fact that uh, uh, years ago, uh, when I first walked in through that church, through those doors, I was dealing with alcoholism. You see, I'd been struggling with alcoholism for two years already. I was 16 when I started. I didn't think I was going to become an alcoholic, but with time going on, drinking every single day, it became a part of what I did. At this point in my life, when you saw the picture, I was drinking from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. I'd pass out uh, drunk. I'd go to parties, and I was the fool at the parties because I was always getting drunk. This is my, this was my lifestyle. This this was my choice, and this is what I was doing, and at times, I wanted to get out of that. At times, I, I, I was tired of it because it felt like I just couldn't stop drinking any longer. I remember going to a concert, B95, the Summer Jam, and uh, uh, this, is, this is my BC before Christ, right? And so I go to Summer Jam. And, and, and I got so twisted, I got so messed up that, that I was fighting people at the concert. My girlfriend had to walk me out. I, I passed out on the, on, on the grass out there by, by the Selland Arena, and her dad has to pick us up. They, they drive us home, and as I get out of his Suburban, I pass out and I hit the asphalt on my head. He, they have to, both my girlfriend and, my, and her dad, have to pick me up and carry me into my front door, knock on the door. My mom opens the door and sees her son wasted this was my story over and over and over again so I got to the point where I got desperate and I knew that if I went to AA I could get some help I went to AA that was the conventional thing right you go to AA they're going to give you some help they're going to give you what you need and so I went there and I was successful one day sober two day sober three days sober one week here I am slipping a beer and then going to AA Another week later, here I am, drinking a little bit more, going back to AA. I know they were smelling that stuff on me. I was over there sharing and all this other stuff, but I was also drunk. And so I realized that before I knew it, I was back at that vicious cycle of drinking every single day, every single day. I couldn't stop. It got to the point that my parents were so worried about me that they actually bought beer and put it in their own refrigerator so that I wouldn't have to go outside of the house and look for beer or ask for beer or do something stupid out there. And so this is where... I found myself. I found myself in this, this place, in this space where I was struggling with alcoholism and I just couldn't seem to shake it. And every time I drank, it got worse because I'd smoke weed and then I'd snort crank. And then before you knew it, I was acting a fool. And it was just a mess. It was a roller coaster of, of, of things that were happening. And, and it was snowballing on me. And before I knew it, I was, I was bound. I was bound by this stuff. But then I remember one night, the night before, I showed up to church. I was at a house party, and uh, uh, I was acting a fool, like always. And I got in this fight, and thankfully some situation happened. It caused me to have to leave the party. I had to walk five miles from the party to my brother's house because I lived with him. And, uh, and it made me think, what am I doing? This is so stupid. I'm tired of this. And I remember then finally getting to my brother's house, woke up the next morning all crudo, ate some menudo, drank some more beer, hoping this would get better. And then I go to church. I go to church, and I'm still hungover. I'm still not feeling good, but at least I'll meet some girls. And I come to the church, and I remember some of y'all are here because of some girls. Y'all came to church because you said, I'm going to meet a girl over there. 
But I remember, I remember, I show up to church, right, and I told the story, but I get there, and at the end, Pastor Sam Emery preaches a message. I can't tell you what he preached, but I can tell you what I felt. The Holy Ghost was moving. The power and the presence of God was in that house. People were at the altar crying, giving their lives to the Lord. And I remember I'm sitting back there arguing with God about how I don't want to surrender, but I could feel the power and the presence of God. And I remember thinking, I've done this before. I've cried before, and I, and I do this, and I cry at the altar, but then I find myself going back to that vicious cycle of alcohol. And so I remember just thinking, God, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And I couldn't resist God's presence anymore. So I remember lifting up my hands that day and just crying out to God and asking God, God, here I am, Lord. If, I, if I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this from this day forward. I'm not going back. And I'm telling you, I've been 23 years clean and sober. I never had another drink of alcohol. I never started another line of crank. I never smoked another joint. I never did anything else. I'm telling you, it was that unconventional encounter like David who took a sling and five smooth stones and slayed the, the, the giant that day. I was able to go into a house. I was able to go to an altar. And I was able to face my giant in an unconventional way. And God set me free from alcoholism. God set me free from meth. God set me free from those addictions that had me back. Come to tell someone today that maybe you're looking for help in other areas and in conventional ways find yourself an altar and I guarantee you the same God that set me free can set you free as well. And so we see here that David fought the giant. This giant could be represented addiction. He fought the giant in an unconventional way. And he had victory over this giant. He gave everyone else victory as well. I'm telling you, God wants to deliver us. Psalm 34, 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me. So the battles over addictions, a man could be won at an old-fashioned altar. Today, before everything's said and done, Pastor Gary said, we're going to have an altar call. And I believe that today, those that may be battling with different types of addictions, those addictions can break in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. But sometimes we fight our addictions, our giants against addiction, and they can't be won like David won the fight against Goliath. Our approach is with the name of the Lord, and we knock it out and we kill it, never again to go back. So this is what one altar call can do. Pastors, don't stop having altar calls. Don't stop having those moments where people can come and give their lives to God, where they can surrender their cares and their struggles and their addictions. We still need to have good, old-fashioned altar calls. And if you believe that, will you clap your hands? But as you read the story of David, you realize that Goliath was not the only giant that he fought. Goliath was not the only giant that he fought. And so in our lives, although we can defeat one giant at an altar call, at times other giants continue to exist. And that was my story. Because I had defeated the giant of alcoholism, and so that meant that if I didn't drink, I didn't snort crank, I didn't smoke weed, I didn't do stupid things, I, I took myself out of danger. So by slaying one giant at the altar, I solved a lot of problems. But there were other problems that still remained. Uh, thankfully, they were not hard problems to defeat, but they were problems nonetheless. nonetheless. They were addictions that I had. And so God doesn't always fight every battle for you. I want to make that clear. There are some battles that God is going to leave behind in order for you to gain endurance so that you can know how to overcome. And so you will say, well, give me the proof, Pastor. Let me see. Well, Judges chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, now these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them. That is, that all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan, this was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. In other words, God will allow opportunities in us to hold on to certain battles so that we can learn to fight for ourselves. 
Because if we don't know how to fight, we're going to lose every time. And so God in his wisdom will take away some of the hardest things in our lives, those things that no matter how hard we try, we just can't get rid of. So in an unconventional way, by going to the altar, God sets us free. But he allows other things to stay in our lives so that we can learn how to overcome because we appreciate what we work for, right? We appreciate what we work for. And so we see that God allowed then uh, the people of Israel to have people to fight against so that they can know what it's like to fight. So they, have, they can have strength. They know what to do. And so other giants were also left behind for David. And so David eventually would have to find himself fighting the other giants. And 2 Samuel chapter 21 verse 15 says that when the Philistines were at war again with Israel, David and his servants went, went down uh, and fought against the Philistines. And David grew faint. He grew faint. He was older. He had won the first battle against the first giant real easy. It was in an unconventional way with a sling and some smooth stones and the name of the Lord. But this time he was fighting and he was fighting for his life. This time he was fighting and he got tired. And one of the giants was huge. It was big and thought he could kill David. He thought he had the victory over him. And he almost did. But thankfully, there was someone there that got to his side and was able to aid him and struck the Philistine and killed him. Yeah. Amen. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there are going to be giants in our lives that God doesn't slay for us, that we have to slay ourselves. Yeah. And so when those giants grow up and they come to show themselves in our lives, we have to be capable yeah. to overthrow them. But there are moments when we cannot do it alone. Tell your neighbor, we can't do it alone. Yeah. Tell your other neighbor, I need you. And so we need one another in order to overthrow and overcome these giants that we face in our lives. Pastor Gary, that's why we can't do church online. That's why we can't do church on the couch or on the table eating a bowl of cereal. Because we're all alone. We need one another. We're the ecclesia. We need to come out from among them, get into the house of God to do battle with one, uh, helping one another. And so, so we need to come to the house of God. And so David, God help, thankfully, he was, over to, he was able to overcome this giant. Another giant stands up. And another guy fights against him and kills him. Another giant stands up, fights against him and kills him. Another giant comes up, fights against him, and he kills him. And so we see here that David was willing to fight, but he wasn't strong enough to do it by himself. He couldn't go back to the old way of going to a sling and some stones. That wasn't going to work. So he knew that, and he, well, I don't know if he knew or not, but thankfully someone else got the hint that he needed help. Yeah. So they got next to him and they slew the giant for him. So as we read further, we see that they were able to help him. So when he defied, defied Israel, Jonathan, uh, I'm sorry, get ahead of myself. Verse 22 uh, of 21, these four were born to the giant of Gath, which is Goliath, uh, uh, in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. In other words, Four men helped David, and because they were involved with David's ministry, it was like as if David and his servants were able to conquer and overthrow these giants. So when we see that there are four giants and four men, this helps us to see how David was able to overcome. And I want to use these four men now as four steps to kill other giants that exist in our lives. More, more uh, I want to talk about the addiction. So how do we overcome other addictions? I can't use anything else but my own personal story. And so when Pastor Gary Duran gave me this assignment to talk about overthrowing or killing the giants in our lives or the giant of addiction in our life, I realized that there are more than one giant. And so at the altar on February the 5th of 2000, I was able to overthrow, to kill, to slay the giant of alcoholism. Yeah. But when I walked out that door and I got to an alley, I pulled out my pack of camel non-filters and I smoked another cigarette. Uh, hardcore. <laughs> what a lay. <laughs> when I was broke, it'd be basic non-filters, but... Uh, and sometimes they were a little bigger, but but here I was, here I was. I, I, I knew, I knew that this was different. I, I, I knew I had overcome alcoholism. I knew that I didn't desire to drink anymore. I defeated that giant at the altar, but I knew that I still had this desire to smoke a frappo. I wanted a cigarette. 
And so I remember going outside and I take another, I, I smoke a whole cigarette. And then I remember, I can't wait for my brother to take us home because I wanted to smoke another cigarette. And I went back and I remember it, it was, it was, I went to church every, every service. I was giving my life to God. There were changes happening inside of me. I was changing the way I dressed. I was changing the way I talked. I was changing what I, I was entertaining myself with. But there were things that, that, that just, I couldn't let go of. And cigarettes was one of those. And so I remember that, 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 that I realized, I recognized after people telling me, me, my parents, my brother, telling me, you need to stop, you need to stop, you need to stop. And I knew that I needed to stop, but I just couldn't seem to stop. And I cry at the altar, God, set me free. God, change me, God, take away the desire. I remember one time I made up my mind. You know what? From this day forward, I'm not doing it again. I remember getting my paycheck. And my tradition was I cash my check at the liquor store. I buy me a, a, a carton of cigarettes, and that's going to last me all week long. And every paycheck, that's what it was. And I told myself, I'm finishing this pack, and I'm not going to buy another carton, and that's what I'm going to do. I remember I made up my mind I was going to do that, and that's what I did. I cashed my check. I bought me a 32 ounce of Pepsi. Back then, they were 39 cents. Supposed to show how old I am. <laughs> I didn't buy my carton of cigarettes. The guy was kind of shocked, but it didn't matter. I went, I went home, and I'm really thinking about, the, did I just really do that? Did I just really go to the store, cash my check, and not buy my carton of cigarettes? And so looking and reflecting then at my life, I begin to think about that, and I, I want to give you four steps, four steps in order to overcome addiction. This is what I did without realizing I did it, but I did it, and now I want to give these four steps to you. And so it's very simple. This is the four men that helped David slay the other giants are going to be the four steps that are going to help us to overthrow and overcome and slay the other giants that we have in addiction in our lives. How many are ready for the four steps? All right. Everybody say, hurry up, Pastor. Four steps. I'm going to read them to you at first, and then we're going to go into it a little deeper. Uh, four steps. Number one, acknowledge you have a problem and name it. With anger. If I'm, if, acknowledge you've got anger issues. But if you have a problem with addiction, whether it's cigarettes, it's drinking, it's smoking, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's porn, it's sex, it's gambling, it's eating. Yeah. I, I, I think one of the biggest addictions in the church is eating. But I won't talk about that, all right? <laughs> overeating, not just eating, overeating. Oh. Number two, make up in your mind to change. Make up in your mind to change. Number three, create a strategy. Find people that you can be accountable to and then learn to replace some things. And I'll share a little bit about that in a few moments. And number four, follow through. Because you, you can acknowledge you have a problem. You can make up your mind. You can create a strategy. But if you don't follow through, you'll be back at that vicious cycle over and over and over again. All right. So we're going to begin by looking at the story of the prodigal son. And in the story of the prodigal son, we see that this man had two sons. And one of them decided that he wanted his money and go. His father was like, okay, you'll get your money. I'll give you your inheritance in advance. And so I was always taught that this was a, a, a thing that was like a slap in the face of the father. But if you understand Jewish culture... The Jewish culture always wants to see their children elevate, become better, and progress. And so this was almost as if it was a loan to say, mijo, go ahead and go start your business. Go do what you got to do and make money now that you're young so that when you're older, you're taken care of. And so the father gives the son his inheritance, his portion, and he takes off, the Bible says. He packs his bag, he takes off. And as he takes off, he begins to live his life as a wild liver he did whatever he wanted to do he partied he went with girls he he did he drank he got high he did all these things thinking that that's what life was all about and in the process he became addicted you could tell because he blew all his money away so he was addicted probably to drugs to alcohol to sex to all these things and so here he finally runs out of money there's a famine there, there's a, a decline in the economy and he finds himself in the worst place possible for a jew Serving pigs in a pig's pen. So here he is in a pig's pen. The Bible tells us that he's there. We don't know how long he's there for. It could have been a year, two years. Here he is at rock bottom. The worst of the worst for him. The Bible tells us then in Luke chapter 15 verse 17. That some days, one day something happened. Something changed. I said, but when he came to himself. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish here with 
hunger. In other words, he came to a moment where he recognized, he acknowledged where he was. He realized that here I am in the worst condition possible because of my decisions. My father's servants, not even the sons, not even the family, but the servants have more food than I have. My father's servants have more than I got because of my stupid decisions. And so he goes on to say, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Make me like your hired servant. So he arose and came to his father. And when he was still yet far off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran to him, hugged and kissed his neck. And, it's the, and the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. So we're going to look at these four steps. Step one, acknowledge you have a problem. We see that he came to himself. Yeah. The only way we'll ever change is when, is when we know that we are in the wrong yeah. and need to change. Yeah. If you don't recognize that you're wrong, you're never going to change because you don't think that you're wrong. Every man is right in his own eyes, the Bible says. And so we think we're right when we're arguing with la vieja. Yeah, no, you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about. No. Sometimes we are wrong, guys. But when it comes to addiction, we have to acknowledge the fact that we are struggling with something. This is why Paul admonishes us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Yeah. Test yourselves. Do you know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you indeed yeah. are disqualified? In other words, the Apostle Paul is telling us that we need to examine where we are. Examine those things that we're struggling with. Yeah. If you're struggling with poor, examine yourself. Is this right? Is this holy? Is this, would this honor my wife? Would this honor my vows? If you're struggling with alcohol, is this beneficial to my family, to my home? If you're struggling with cigarettes, is this going to help my health? I'm telling you, if you're a smoker, quit today. My father died of lung cancer because he was a smoker, and it's an ugly death. Don't go that route. Quit today. I admonish you, quit today. But if you have a problem, examine yourself, acknowledge it, and name it. I have a problem with smoking. I have a problem with drinking. I have a problem with porn. I have a problem with this. I have a problem with that and name it and then when you name it when you acknowledge it then you can make up your mind i'm going to change the direction that i'm going i know this is basic but but the reality is that sometimes some of the most difficult giants to fight is very simple and so when we acknowledge the fact that we have a problem and i think that most of us know that we do we just hide it rather than acknowledging and say i do have this problem then when we, when we make up in our minds that we're going to make a change, we have to make up our mind to change. So the Bible tells us uh, 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 that, that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we have to then understand that we have to not only acknowledge our mistake, our addictions, but we also have to make up our mind that we're going to change. That's why the Apostle Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to change our mind. If we change our mind, we change our direction. And so we have to, number two, make up our mind to change. And number three, then we have to create a strategy. So this is what he says. He says, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, the, pro the prodigal son didn't just just say i got a problem he didn't just say i'm here with the pigs he didn't just say this is pretty bad no he decided to acknowledge his situation and he decided then to examine himself and recognize where he was and then from there he decided to create a strategy to say i have to do something different i can't do what i've always done because i'll find myself over and over at the pig's pit i'll find myself at rock bottom i have to change my mind and then I have to create a plan. So he says, I will arise, I'll go to my father, and I'll say this. We must create a plan of action. We can acknowledge our addiction. We can make up our mind. But if we don't have a plan of action, we will not kill the giants of addiction. That's what I did. My only plan was I want to change. I'm going to go to AA. Guess what? That was a horrible plan. Can't say, I don't want to say that it doesn't work for everybody, but it sure didn't work for me. So there's, there, there's a thing called the five P's. Anybody heard the five P's? Poor planning produces poor performance. Poor planning produces poor performance. 
And so we can acknowledge that we have a, an issue. We can, we can desire to change our thinking, change the direction that we're going in our mind. But if we don't create a strategy, we'll have no way to get us to where we want to go. And so we could not have any planning. Poor planning produces poor performance. And we'll find ourselves yeah. then not accomplishing uh, us becoming free from the thing that has us bound. Yeah. If your struggle is poor, turn, turn the phone off. Go get a yeah. flip phone. Get, put, put, put something on your computer. Uh, tell your wife to check your stuff after you're gone it. Do things that make sense because poor planning produces poor, poor performance. Find yourself someone you can be accountable to. If you're struggling with alcohol, don't go to the bar. Don't go to the alcohol section. If you're struggling with cigarettes, get, get, a, get away from people that are smoking. Don't go out on your lunch break or on your 15 break and go with the smokers. No, find somewhere else to go. But, but, but create a plan, a strategy to help you to get out of the situation that you're in. <laughs> Create a plan. Jesus tells us this way. For which of you intend to build a tower and does not sit down first and account for the cost, whether it's enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation is not able to finish it, and all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build but was not able to finish. How many times have we wanted to do something, change, get rid of some addiction that we're struggling with, we, we, we have this big dream. I'm not going to do it. I, I did it. I wanted to quit drinking. I went to AA. I talked to my dad. I asked anyone that I could about, uh, uh, about it. And yet, yet, yet I, I had no plan. I had no plan. And so I, 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 I spoke about it. I drew up the plan, the, the, the design I, of what it was going to look like. I, I laid the foundation. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to read the 12 steps. And, but but I, had, I had not enough to finish the project of freeing myself or being free from alcoholism. And so Jesus tells us that we have to then create a plan. We have to consider the cost, consider what it's going to take, and then create a plan using that. So what do we do? We've got to find someone to be accountable to. Find someone to be accountable to. Someone that will hold you to your plan, but also keep your secrets. All right. All right. That's good. Because in sharing, in creating the strategy, you're going to become vulnerable. And you're going to share some things that you would not ever want anyone to know. Yeah, yeah. We all have secrets. Yeah. We all have issues. We all have some type of addiction. And so some are more embarrassing than others. And so we got to find someone that will hold us accountable to our plan and keep our secrets. So who do you, who do you seek after? A pastor, a deacon, an assistant pastor, a minister, a counselor. Talk to someone that will hold you accountable and keep your secret. Number two, replace. Learn to replace some things. This should be part of your strategy. For me, for me, if you know me, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a coffee drinker. I love coffee. I drink coffee a lot. Uh, I, I own part of Starbucks here in Sanger. <laughs> Pastor, when, when it's, it's Pastor Duran's turn for us to meet. We meet at McDonald's. When it's my turn, we meet, eat at Starbucks. But for me, it's coffee. You see, I was able to slay the giant of alcoholism at the altar. But the giant of cigarettes was a whole nother story. So I remember that I had, I had certain triggers, certain cues. Yeah. I ate. After I was done eating, I'd smoke. Go to the bathroom, I'd smoke. Go outside, I'd smoke. Wake up, I'd smoke. Before I go to bed, I'd smoke. So I had these cues. When things happened, I, it triggered me to go and smoke. So guess what I did? We filled up that pot of coffee at my mom's house, and every time I ate after I ate a, a meal, I drank a cup of coffee. When I got up in the morning, guess what I drank? A cup of coffee. Went to the restroom after I was done, I drank a cup of coffee. I replaced something yeah, yeah. for something else, something bad for something good. Coffee's of God. It's the will of the Lord. <laughs> But you got to learn to replace some things. That's got to be part of your strategy, right? You have to learn to replace. And, you can, and I can, we could talk about this even further. I'm not going to take up your time. But number, number three, you, you have to know your cues. You have to know those things that trigger you to want to do those things. If you're lonely and you're into porn, guess what? You're going to go find yourself a corner. You're going to get into that. 
And why am I talking about porn? Because one of the biggest struggles in men in the church is porn. I'm just gonna be honest. This is the biggest struggle, right? And so, and so, if you're going to, uh, if you're going to go back to that, if you're trying to get away from that, know your cues. And so, instead of yeah. no, feeling this loneliness and yeah. saying, you know what, or I'm not satisfied by my wife, or whatever the re- reason might be that triggers you to go to that, just say, you know what, I'm gonna change it. I'm gonna know that this is a cue, this is a trigger, so I'm gonna do something opposite That's of that. That's number four. Number four. The fourth <laughs> step is follow through follow through. And so I didn't, I didn't realize this at the time. It wasn't a step thing for me, but I remember when I, when I, was, when I was going to release this addiction of, of smoking, I knew I had a problem. Everybody told me. I knew I had a problem because I couldn't stop as much as I wanted to, as much as I tried, but I acknowledged my problem. named it. You have a problem with smoking, dude. Number two, I made up, I made up my mind to change. Yeah. I said, this is the last one. I'm not going back into that store to buy another carton. This is it. Number three, I created a strategy. Chris, that's my older brother. If you hear, smell smoke on me, tell me. Big Joe, if you smell smoke on me, tell me. Finally, it took follow through. I had to go to that store, that liquor store, on that Friday afternoon with my $152 check. Minimum wage was horrible back then. <laughs> it still is. Everything else just went up, right? Matter of fact, the other day I was really curious, and I asked, I asked someone at, at 7-Eleven, I think it was, how much is a carton of cigarettes? And they told me like 70, 80 bucks, something like that. I don't, and I, when I was a kid, it was eight, uh, $30, right, for the Camel non filters. So it's gone up a lot, so whatever. Anyway. The dumb questions I ask sometimes is, and so, and so I had to, I had to follow through. So here I am at the yeah. counter. The guy knows me already. He knows what I'm ask, going to ask for. I'm going to cash my check, and I want a carton. Uh, I think at that point I, it was basic non filters because it was cheaper, and uh, and 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 I didn't order it. And he said, "You don't, you don't want your carton?" I said, "No, I'm going to quit smoking." I had a few more cigarettes in my little pack. I finished those up. I was trying to hold on to every little one. I wasn't that spiritual person that threw in the trash or the flush them down the toilet. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. No, no, it was, it was a process. It wasn't easy. But I followed through. And I wish I knew the date. I wish I'd, I would have written it down. I don't even know if I really believed in myself back then. Uh, but I just knew that I had to follow through, and I followed through that day. And it's been 23 years. I can tell you this. It's been almost 23 years, almost 23 years since I've smoked a cigarette. <laughs> so you might be here today and say, I don't have any addictions, Pastor. Your message does not apply to me. We all struggle with something. We all struggle with something. We all have some type of addiction somewhere. We're just not public about it. It's no one's business but us, ours, God's, and that person that we can share with and trust. We can't do some things alone. David couldn't. David slayed the first giant in a miraculous, supernatural way. We slay some giants in a supernatural way. But other times, we're left to fight those battles on our own. Because it builds us up. It strengthens us. And we appreciate that. When we can't win the battle, God comes in and gives us grace. God does the work. But when God sees that we can, if we just simply decide to do it, create a plan and follow through that he will give us that opportunity to do so we appreciate what God does you might say I don't have addictions if we're not careful certain little things little foxes can eventually become an addiction it's what I love about the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.12 where he says, 
All things are lawful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's no rule, no Bible verse, no law against this. Actually, he didn't say that. The Corinthian church said that. That was a Corinthian slogan. But his response to that was, but all things are not helpful. Might be okay. It's not helpful. Their response to them is, again, all things are not lawful. But his response was, but I will not be brought under the power of any. It might be okay, but I'm not going to become an addict to that. I want every eye closed. I feel a supernatural touch in this house right now. Every eye closed because we want to remain private. But if you are struggling with some type of addiction, I want every man to honor this. So keep your eyes closed. Honor this by keeping your eyes closed. But if you are struggling with any type of addiction, maybe it's gambling, maybe it is porn, maybe it is sex, maybe it is it's money, maybe it's, it's smoking, maybe it's drinking, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's food, whatever you're addicted to, it doesn't matter. But if you're here today and you're struggling with some type of addiction, I want you to raise your hand towards heaven. No one watching, no one watching, no one watching, no one watching. Honor your brother, no one watching. I'm not even watching. I want to thank you for being honest and acknowledging your addiction. You can put your hand down. Now, I want us all to stand to our feet, and I just want to pray a simple prayer over you. I know we're going to have an altar call at the end, and I believe that at that altar call, some addictions are going to break in the mighty name of Jesus. Raise your hands again towards heaven. Father, I pray in your precious name. You see these men, these men that love you, that desire to serve you, that give their all, God, to you. They're not here because they want to go through the motions, but they're here because they desire, God, to slay the giants in their lives. Whether it's fear, whether it's anger, whether it's addiction, or even rejection. Lord, I pray today that you would help us, God, to bind together, to pray for one another, and to understand, Lord, that you have given us power, not just in our own human ability, but also with the Holy Ghost to overcome these addictions. But even in those moments, God, when you don't supernaturally take away that addiction from us, you've given us the ability to look at four steps that we can take in order to change the direction of our life, in order to break the back of addiction. Father, I pray today that we would take this word to heart and that we would apply it to our lives, that we would not be hearers but doers of the word. I pray today for your people, God. Give us the strength. Give us the strength. Give us the strength that we need, God to overcome. We pray this today in the mighty, beautiful, matchless name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. If you receive that, will you clap your hands and give God some praise?